Welcome and aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii today. We're going to kind of go out there today and explore change, how it happens, what it takes to happen, where it goes and why, where resistance and receptivity in people might be and might be accessible or not. Um, and on that, we have one of my favorite people, Larry Bridgesmith in Nashville, Tennessee. Larry is an expert of so many things, I'm not even going to take your time trying to highlight them or bullet point them. But Larry, tell us a little bit about kind of who you are professionally. Very good. And uh, what Chuck is trying to say is I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, but I just keep looking. <laughs> but uh, I have been a practicing lawyer for over 40 years, the last 20 of which really has been focused on resolving disputes before court, including how better to negotiate and mediate. And that's what I teach at the Vanderbilt Law School and at the Arizona State School of Law. I am not an academic. I am a pracademic. So that means that I don't have to go through all those meetings and write all those papers. I, I love connecting with the next generation of lawyers. And in that vein, uh, created at Vanderbilt the program on law and innovation about 15 years ago. And that's where I, my passion lies, is helping the deliverer of professional services understand how better to do it more effectively, efficiently, and with greater quality. Hope that helps. A, a lot. Well, what is guardrail technologies and legal alignment? You know, legal alignment is the company out of which I'm the sole proprietor. Uh, but it's how I uh, represent my legal services as a mediator and as a trainer, because when we can align legally, we've made the problem go away. Guardrail Technologies is an organization that was just created a year ago in the wake of ChatGPT and generative AI and the need for all businesses as well as professional services to understand both the great value of generative AI as well as how to mitigate its risks. So that's what we do at Guardrail Technologies. We help install guardrails around AI. Wow. And you've also, besides those business markets, you've also done some stuff with med students and doctors, right? Yes, um, it's another professional service uh, sector. And I, I've i taught medical ethics at the Albany School of Law. And I, every year, teach a group of executive physicians identified by the Tennessee Medical Association as upcoming leaders. But the message is almost always the same. And that is, how do we help people change their minds whether we're doing so as a leader, a lawyer, a negotiator, a mediator, it's it's what is the neuroscience and the social culture around change and how do we best embrace it and guard it if it's dangerous, but nonetheless exploit it if it's not. And that leads us right into where we're going. So I'm just going to turn it over to you, take over, tell us about Anything you want about change. Well, thank you, Chuck. I, it's one of my favorite topics because it's just so difficult for us as human beings. We are not wired for change. We are wired for certainty and comfort and status quo. It's just where we want to remain. And when the word change is thrown into the conversation, most of us recoil in horror. But we've all changed change is constant. And to suggest that it's not is to hopefully understand that status quo is equivalent to death. Change is the essence of life. But let me give you some historical examples to sort of Ill illustrate the social, cultural, and individual reaction to change. Everybody knows that the steam engine was uh, created decades and centuries ago. It was actually first invented in uh, 1712. And 
it is fascinating that it was measured by horsepower. How much horsepower does a steam engine generate? Because the industry previous to that was all ridden and driven by horses. But it wasn't until the early 18th, late 18th and 19th century that steam engines became commonplace because from the date of their invention to the adoption by the large majority of the populace and businesses, it was something to be afraid of. It was something that was risky. It changed too many things when we moved from an equine or horse-driven economy to a machine economy powered by steam engines. But that's not the only time. Uh, the telephone, as we all can remember, by Alexander Graham Bell, may not remember the date of its creation, but it was invented in 1876. But it wasn't until the 20s and 30s in the 1900s that it became widely accepted as a valuable and essential tool for communication. And the assembly line was also one of those major innovative changes Henry Ford first put it in the into work in 2000, excuse me, nine, nine, 1904, but it wasn't adopted by businesses until the 20s and 30s. And now we're getting into the scary stuff because those things are all ancient history for us and who cares really. But it was in 1956 that the word artificial intelligence was coined by Dr. John Danforth from the Dartmouth School of Mathematics. And it was a, a word in his words that simply said, any machine that is capable of doing the work of a human is artificial intelligence. So when you stop to think about it in those terms, calculators, typewriters, any number of tools could be considered artificial intelligence. But when it came up in the context of electronics and software and functioning like a human would function cognitively, it became very, very wary. Matter of fact, that it was it went into what was called the AI winter in in subsequent years and decades following its first acknowledgement. It wasn't until Recently, the first century of the 2000s, the, the, I'm sorry, the first decade of the 2000s, that we began to see artificial intelligence. And we probably all stood up, stood up and take notice when the IBM Watson intellectual and artificial intelligent engine beat the world's Jeopardy champs. And that was in 2012. Artificial intelligence has continued to evolve, and it is ancillary to a lot of other technologies, which we're very familiar with, like email. It was first invented in the 1960s, and it wasn't commonly used by the public until the 1990s. And there are even court cases which you can find a judge, a federal judge, ordering uh, attorneys not to use email because it was subject to the breach of client confidentiality. But where would we be without email today? We don't even stop to think about email as a danger to the human. And similarly, the internet. It first was created for science and research in the 1970s, but it was only popularized in the early 2000s, and it really became a real thing to the common user in 2004. And the internet was first developed, but now where would we be without it? And the same, I think, can be said of generative AI. It's just one of many branches of artificial intelligence. But when it broke on the scene in November of 2022, the world sat up and took notice and said, this is different. Well, each of these could conceivably be considered industrial revolutions. And whether it's the first or the fifth, generative AI is being viewed as incredibly powerful and yet incredibly risky, just like all of those other inventions that preceded it. So 
how do we deal with change? And this is where I've really come to appreciate the work of Clayton Christensen and his student, Jeffrey Moore. Clayton Christensen was a renowned uh, professor of business at Harvard Business School, uh, died just a couple of years ago, and Jeffrey Moore was one of his students. Christensen came up with the idea, the concept, and the book of the innovator's dilemma, meaning how do innovators succeed in conveying their concepts and their solutions to human problems to those who could benefit from them? And that is the innovator's dilemma. You think back against all of those examples we just saw. There was an invention, there was a great deal of skepticism, and yet there was a great deal of need. And ultimately that need was recognized. Well, Jeffrey Moore wrote the book, Crossing the Chasm, which is the best illustration visually that I know of to bring neuroscience and social science together to show how we can change minds if we just understand the dynamic of doing so. And this is his bell curve. And he references in that gray area, the chasm of chaos, which is the essence of change. It's when things become uncertain and unknown and very threatening to the vast majority of people. On the left-hand side, you see a little segment of that bell curve that is referencing the work of innovators. And on the opposite side, you see a similarly small slice that represents laggards. Now, innovators are saying in figurative language, it's time to change everything and this is how we're gonna do it. Laggards tend to say, you're not gonna change anything over my dead body. They are resistant to change in the extreme, but that's not most of the world. Because in the middle of this bell curve, some 60 to 80% of the population are the pragmatists, the people who do what's necessary to succeed and survive, even though it may be uncomfortable to change. And there are two segments of those, the early pragmatists and the late pragmatists. And so when you look across the spectrum of this bell curve, you can see how the chaos of change interferes with the journey from pragmatism to innovation, which is why the most important segment of this bell curve are the early adopters. Innovators will not influence laggards, and they pose a threat to pragmatists. But early adopters are those people and organizations who have been pragmatic, but come to understand that the status quo is not sufficient. It's broken. And the early adopters have come across the chasm to say on the other side of all that confusion, well, what do we do about it? How do we fix this broken economy, this broken organization, or my own broken thinking? I need to find a solution. So the early adopters risk the chaos to find those solutions and change occurs when the pragmatists look across that chasm and see that the early doctors have figured something out that they need to know. It's said in the recovery community that no one changes until the pain of change is more attractive than the pain of staying the same. And that to me is the essence of change. So whether we're mediators or business leaders, academics, community organizers, for us to think, and it's proven to be foolish, that we can simply tell people what they need to do and they'll do it, is just badly mistaken. The people who need to change have to first want to change. And that only happens when they see that the pain of change is less by a significant amount than the pain of staying the same. That's when we wake up and then begin to see the other side of the chasm and look for the solutions that the early adopters are already applying. So in my view, although it seems simplistic, whether it's neuroscience or business, it's the job of change agents to not force change, 
nobody changes if they're forced. But to incentivize change so that whether you're a person in a mediation, a hard-fought domestic relations matter, business dispute, or whether you're in a family situation in which change is needed, how can we help others see the what's in it for me value of change? So that's what we're facing right now with generative AI and other emerging technologies. We have to find out quickly how best to mitigate the risks and gain the benefit of that change. Does that give any questions for you, Chuck? I have millions and millions. <laughs> One of the things that might be fun to do is hey, pick an example area anywhere you want. I mean, one that comes to mind just because we're in the middle of the Democratic National Convention. And boy, I was watching yesterday. And if there's one thing you can feel in that room, <laughs> it is definitely a receptivity to change, a very high incentivization for change. And the charisma of the presenters eh, to, to do that. I mean, just you look at Oprah and Shapiro and Tim Walls and I mean, they're just each of them in completely different ways. Boy, if you wanted somebody hey, to look good to early adopters, and I remember one time you sent me that video of Woodstock where all these people are sitting on the hillside watching the music, and they're kind of bopping in time and stuff. Hey, and a guy gets up and he starts going back freaking crazy, arms, legs all over the place, jumping and just dancing totally free form. Hey, and everybody's looking at him like he's a crazy guy. What the hell? Until two or three more get up. And within minutes, everybody on that hillside is up going nuts and totally connected physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually to the music. There's almost no distinction between that mass of people as a system and individually and the music. How does that happen? Well, I, I think it's all the same. I mean, we're talking about the same human response to the status quo and the change that they would like to be a part of. Because the status quo in a public setting is be still and don't get crazy. Well, that's a video you can now find on the internet if you seek it, the dancing crazy guy. Well, the dancing crazy guy got carried away with the music. And one by one, and then 10 by 10, and then literally the virtual entire audience was dancing like crazy. Without that first mover, the rest would not have moved. That I mean, that's just human nature. We don't want to bring attention to ourselves. And if I'm doing something that others might think is crazy, I'm probably not going to do it. But let's take that back to your example. Because politics is all about change. I mean, there's been no campaign ever that has not focused on how the candidate will change things for the better. So if change is what people are looking for in their candidates, the question is, what change are they advocating? So if we're talking with people who are advocating for progressive change, on one side, what they're looking for are the crazy dancing men who are out there exhibiting what that change would look like. And if what we are looking for in a candidate is someone who will take us back to the good old days, then they're looking for someone who will be that crazy man. The point of all of that is to not label anybody crazy. It's just the nature of, of humans. We are, we are sheep when it comes to doing things that are risky, until the first mover shows that it's better than doing nothing, most of us simply won't move. We'll stay in the status quo that we've come to expect. So when you look at, for example, the 2024 campaign, where it is now, not where it was weeks ago, but where it is right now and going forward, what do you see? relative to change, differences, mm -hmm. forces? <laughs> well, 
Well, I mean, that's such a multi-tiered and multifaceted question. There's so many answers to that question. Uh, but just to simplify it for my simple brain is, is the change you're looking for something that you have enjoyed in the past and want to return to it? Or is the change you're looking for a somewhat progressive, if not radical, change in the status quo? So the messaging of the two conventions is worth examining for what change is being advocated. And if it's advocation of the change that will modify the, certain, the, the current status quo and improve the conditions of the most people, that will be very attractive to those people who have come to understand that. You may recall that in the 2020 election, as well as the same time frame in which Brexit occurred in the UK, that it came out later that there were very sophisticated AI engines that were seeking to create change for the benefit of one side or the other in those two massive elections, the UK Brexit vote and the US presidential election. What it proved to be was this very sophisticated technology company called uh, uh, Galactics, Ana Analytic Galactica, that operated with an uh, unknown but previously provided database from Facebook of all of its users. Galactica did not intend, nor did it ever attempt, to change the mind of someone who had already decided their position on either of those issues. What they looked for was that very thin margin of people who were truly undecided, not simply afraid to say who they were favoring, but they were truly undecided. Those were the people that Galactica inundated with false information so that they could influence them to go one way rather than the other because they were undecided. And so I, I think that's another example of how even elections on a national basis are focused on what are the innate desires of the human that need to be satisfied. And when you can create an attractive alternative, that's what moves those who need to move, whichever direction it goes. And you've just brought up again uh, this incredibly potentially powerful force about which so little is known and so little can be predicted, AI, generative AI in particular. What role and value, positive and, and potentially destructive, do you see for generative AI in the politics of today? Yeah. Well, um, at, at Guardrail, we, we are very focused on misinformation and factual error in any kind of internet-based communication. So if we can be advised of the facts behind claims made, is it trustworthy or is it fictional? we can make a better decision about whether we're going to be influenced by that information. So one of the applications, the one that is uh, most in sight of those who really like the option is our fact checker and our counterpoint checker. And what guardrail does is attempt to put guardrails around this powerful thing called generative AI so that the risks can be identified, such things as hallucination and breaches of privacy, uh, confidentiality concerns, all of those things are risks that must be managed. But think back to the steam engine. Think back to the automobile, the telephone, the internet, email. It wasn't until those guardrails were well known by the people who had yet to cross the chasm that they became popular and used without concern. It's just the same principle in politics as it is in technology and business and neighborhood disputes. How can we help people open their minds to examine their 
preordained decisions about any particular proposition to examine the real facts, the supportable facts, and if they are open-minded at all, that can help them shift from one view to another. So here's one question that comes to mind. Would it be possible to appropriately use generative AI to help people see how the different political change offered by each group mm -hmm. might impact their lives? Yes, um, there's somewhat of a limited potential today, but as a professor, as a mediator, as a trainer in negotiation, in any of those settings, I will revert first to generative AI. And not just one, but several models. I mean, it's not just ChatGPT out there. There's Anthropic's Clause, there's Perplexity, there's Google Gemini. I will prod those generative AI models to provide me with information on which I can make a decision. So your question asks, first, can we find information about which we need to be informed? Yes, generative AI does that as long as we're aware of its tendencies to hallucinate when it can't find the right answer. Um, unless though we're searching and if we are simply relying on the powers that be to frame our thinking, if that's a decision that we have reached consciously or subconsciously, the likelihood of changing our mind is very, very slim. I mean, Galactica established that fact when they chose to find those who hadn't made their minds up. They were influenceable. But if we've decided something is sock Rollins truthful, even if it's false, you probably can't persuade me that it's false. In the confirmatory bias, all of the heuristics of the human brain work against the awareness of the value of change. So if we were going to try and get a sense, it sounds like one of the critically, crucially important starting points for the human part of the interaction with generative AI is to figure out what information to include in that question, that prompt, mm -hmm. how to present it. Yep. And then with that, how to present the question. It's precisely right. And uh, prompting is the key to getting good information. It's the old adage, bad data in, bad data out. Well, if our prompts aren't well crafted, and if we don't engage in a conversation with the large language model, and if we just ask a simple single sentence question, we're going to get answers but they're not like a conversation with someone who can inform us. So we begin with a well-crafted prompt and there are tools out there to help do that. I have used Prompt Perfect to do that for the last couple of years. It helps you engineer a prompt to better state your question and then you can choose which large language model you wish to submit it to. Uh, and not to be selling, but that's one of the features of the guardrail suite as well, is prompting better than we tend to ask questions when the information is so vast. So do you and guardrail technologies or others that you're aware of actually help people to understand how to gather and assemble data, filter it, and develop prompts? queries, yeah. questions. Yeah, precisely right. That I mean, that it's not natural to us. It's not, a, well, there are digital natives out there, you know, our children's children who probably have a much better 
automatic sense of that than we do, but it's not natural for us to converse with a machine. It's abnormal. And so if we can learn how, and that's whether it's by training or by technology, to utilize these tools with their incredible power for good rather than for pernicious reasons that someone else has chosen to use it to fool us. I mean, deep fakes are a great example of how malicious people can take these tools and do enormous damage. We have to be able to know that there are ways to limit that damage by finding the fact and the original sources of both information and computer code. Because without that, we're simply trusting the AI to do what it will do. I was very troubled last week to read an article published um, by several scientists, in, uh, computer engineers and software engineers. And it was called the scientist AI. And its premise was that you could create a set of technologies that automated the search for science, for validating a new proposition, and even for writing a treatise to support the work by themselves. Well, that's another word for what the technologists call general intelligence. Today, we have very narrow intelligence in our tools, something like um, Grammarly or uh, word check, spelling check. That's AI, but it's operating in a very obvious and simple manner. And the generative AI application is much less certain because it's operating on whatever data it's been trained. And we don't even know what that data is. So whether it's a publicly provided large language model or increasingly private large language models, in other words, using only the data that an individual or an organization has acquired over time, you can have private LLMs that massage that data, analyze your questions, and provide you answers. But those answers will still only come out of the data set on which that LLM has been trained. So when you look at these large language commercial models, um, shortly after ChatGPT hit the market, um, it, it, initially it was, I think the words were it was like 80 to 85% accurate in doing mathematical equations. But in a very short period of time, users who didn't know math were feeding it information that trained it to answer math poorly. In a simple expression, a simple example, initially ChatGPT answered the question, what is two plus two as four? But shortly after that, the answer became five. And it was because of the data that had been injected into the data training set. So it is not perfect. Generative AI is probabilistic. And when it can't find the answer, it finds one and creates an answer because it wants to satisfy you. So we're out of time for today. I wanna to thank Larry Bridgesmith for some incredible insights and history and background. And for your last words, if you were gonna try and encapsulate your advice to people on how best to learn how to use and deal with and, and be affected by generative AI. What would be your words of wisdom? Well, there are lots of uh, very credible training sources. I think of Coursera. Uh, if you have an organization, for example, all of the academic organizations to which I am associated have great learning materials, online videos and instructions because the goal of using generative AI well is learning how it can go wrong. 
and then avoiding anything that that is generated that is untrustworthy. So there are many, many courses out there that anyone can take, most of them for free. You can go to IBM's website, Microsoft's website. Um, you can even YouTube search for how do I deal with generative AI? Again, you got to check the quality of the source. We can't take everything for granted or accept it at face value. But the more credible the source, the better the education and the training will be. There's no end to the training for someone who wants to know more about it. And that's a great place to wrap up. Hmm. Larry Bridgesmith, thanks so much for an incredibly concentrated focus half hour introduction to a lot of things about change and the role and value of generative AI and of humans in dealing with it in that. Think Tech Hawaii, thank you so much for joining us. I hope this will be thought provoking and stimulating for all of you and come join us again next week. Take care. Thank you all. Thanks, thanks Jim.